I have been working for many years at the Deccan University of Vienna, and as a university, you always have to look a little bit ahead of time. And I think the industrial transformation of the technology which we developed at the university into industrial products has been performed by Petitech in a just excellent way. We uh, personally, but I am now already retired from the university, but I'm still doing some research. And I think one of the focus of my research is to look at the complexity of systems. And I'm very pleased that Andreas invited me to give a talk about this topic here. There basically, we can distinguish between three subsystems, the operator, the cyberspace, which is normally a distributed computer system, and the physical system, which is the engine or the, the physical environment that is controlled by the cyber system. And if you look at these two spaces, the physical space and the cyberspace, they are fundamental differences. So we need a computational model where physical time and execution time are properly integrated. And I think this integration of physical progress in the physical environment and computational progress in the computational environment is a key issue in, in the system design. Please come up stage and give us your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Stein. This talk is not about uh, to uh, convince you that deterministic Ethernet is uh, the most advanced network on the planet and actually in the universe, as you have seen. Um, but it's more intended to give an a kind of a background on why the deterministic Ethernet uh, looks as it looks today. What we really want to achieve is the notion of mixed criticality on the node level, where you have hard and software measures in place that guarantee you inference freedom or minimize the interference of the tasks from the different applications on each other. We want to extend this to the network. So it's key that we want to use one single physical network to host the applications uh, in your system, all the applications in your system. We want to minimize the number of different buses that you use in your system. Just to give you an idea is that this was fully compatible to the IEEE standards. So when you talk about Ethernet, we typically refer to two things, to IEEE 802.3, which defines the physical layer and the, the, the MAC layers, and uh, we talk about uh, the IEEE 802.1, which defines functionality that's implemented in network switches, for example, in Ethernet switches. People just at uh, a, a very high level, we say, okay, let's take the average, but you know, we know average is average, but if we care about the phase of execution, and this is something that we do care in real-time system, it very, very depends in even this uh, uh, loop, you are doing floating point or integer or vector operation, and it very, very depends on the activity, so you cannot understand the power without understanding the software. And this is something that we see all over again, that uh, doing good power management or understanding the power of the system, you need to do software hardware co-design. You cannot do a good power management just by looking on the hardware or on the software alone. You must understand both sides. This is a picture from um, Poland, uh, from KGHM, this, the third largest copper producer on the globe. They are using conveyors to actually transport goods. They actually have 120 kilometers of these conveyors. For every major, there is three of these idlers. In every idler, there are two bearings, which are responsible for that idler to actually revolve. If we summarize that, we come to something like 720,000 <coughs> bearings which we actually want to monitor. And that's what's just one company. You have an ECU for driver assistance, and then you could run script based test specifications where you emulate the displays and the inputs and the screen model. The whole thing is kind of a virtual prototype simulator with a computer. Now, if you look at the development phases, this is from Hitachi, who are also thinking in this direction. You start with a, um, a pure model-based approach where you have abstract models. Uh, fast platforms are available and since they are in the computer, of course, debugging is much easier. I have a slide that shows this. So that means you can validate your hardware software integration one year before the availability of the real hardware. And this is basically how you look at the whole development cycle, a hardware spec, and you have the block design, board design. We have an Eon processor, we also have an ARM processor within the EFC square. And then we have all, let's say, hardware components you need to make a typical computer system using a typical <coughs> MR AHP bus.
I would like to welcome you for this uh, EMC2 conference. Uh, this is the second conference that we have, and you are the, the coordinator, Dr. Weber. And I would like to ask you if you could explain us very shortly what is the essence of the EMC Square project, what is the content of it. Could you summarize that in a few words? The situation is this we have advanced in semiconductor technology very quickly, the applications are done too quickly mostly in consumer applications. Consumer applications are happy with sort of functioning, like 95% functioning, they are happy. If there is a failure, uh, you switch off the device, switch it on again, it will work then. In professional applications and in applications with real-time requirements, such an approach is not possible. So both in applications of mobility like cars, airplanes, space application, but also in applications with large numbers or large amounts of data like you have in manufacturing, in, um, in, in large data centers, you need a much higher level of reliability and uh, EMC2 wants to close that gap. So this is the main purpose of it and mixed criticality, dynamic reconfiguration on the software and on the hardware level, and hardware complexity in terms of multi-cores is the essence of this project. Oh, that sounds really very, very interesting. I've been just told that this is a huge number of partners here. Can you give us some of the key figures of the project so yeah. you get an impression? In fact, it is the largest Artemis project ever. It has exactly 100 partners, it has a budget of 80 million, so it is really large and we believe that essentially the entire uh, European industry and the key players in the academic area are in the project and exchange with one another, which is exactly what we want. That's really amazing. Uh, how do you really deal with all these complex uh, challenges in handling such a huge team? Could you elaborate on this a little bit? Yes, um, in fact, uh, I'm not doing all the work. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of responsibility is delegated towards the work package leaders and the work package leaders, of course, have to delegate it down to the partner level. And um, I think we have a relatively clear cut between the different levels of responsibility. And um, so even such a large project can be handled. Of course, it requires a lot of dedication from my side, from the side of the project assistant, Alfred. Uh, uh, but um, I'm, I'm very confident now, uh, after one and a half years, that we can deal with this complexity. I think it can be done. Thank you very much, Dr. Weber, and we wish you a lot of success. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you.